Whenever we imagine alien civilizations, we tend to subconsciously make assumptions about them based on how we are. After all, as far as civilizations go, we currently work off a sampling of one, us. Sometimes these aliens are envisioned as enlightened, peaceful beings that would help humanity solve its problems if we came into contact with them. Sometimes we envision the opposite as an invading alien civilization out to take over Earth and subjugate, or eliminate, humanity altogether. In truth, however, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle, making the actions of alien civilizations unpredictable, and maybe even outright incomprehensible. But even in the middle lie some terrifying possibilities. So here are 10 really scary alien civilization scenarios. Number 10. All spacefaring alien civilizations are necessarily aggressive. There is a need for some level of aggressiveness in nature. This can be for self-defense, territoriality, or even the simple act of eating. The one does not need too much aggressiveness to eat plants, but you do for hunting down caribou that do. But they can run, and they do have some defenses. This translates up to humanity. Obviously, we can be very aggressive when we need to. But in a technological sense, being aggressive means to push limits, such as building a technological rocket, put some humans in it, and shoot them off into orbit. This is not something we biologically need to do. Humans did not evolve and are not adapted to space, nor is there any food there. But it's something we do because we want to do it, a drive to explore and expand our horizons, and that requires some level of aggressiveness. That's probably the case for alien civilizations. The more aggressive they are, the further they push out into space. Without an aggressive tendency, it's hard to envision an alien civilization leaving its home planet at all, or even feeling the need to develop technology, even if they are intelligent and know they can do so. Or it might be a mixed bag where they develop medical and life extension technologies, but never see the need to push out into space and simply live within their means on their homeworld, avoiding danger and death. This leaves the possibility that space is filled only with highly aggressive species. But the saving grace here is that we can mostly control our aggression, and they may be able to do so as well. It could be like Star Trek, where you can have a drink with a Klingon, but don't push it. Or it could be much worse, and there lurks something out there that we may never want to run into. Number 9. The Civilization Literally Next Door there are two ways to look at the distribution of alien civilizations in the galaxy and speculate about them. The first is statistical. The closer a star system is to you, the less likely it is for it to be inhabited. Flukes can happen, of course, but this was one of the main arguments made during the BLC-1 SETI candidate signal discussion, that if it were picked up from literally the next star system to us, then that would be highly unlikely, unless the galaxy wasn't just inhabited, but very much so. Almost everywhere would have to have a presence of an alien civilization, and if that were the case, we should be picking up technosignature candidates left and right. We are not, so it stands to reason that that particular signal almost certainly was of human origin. But then there is another way to look at it. This was the thinking of Enrico Fermi, where the galaxy has had plenty of time for other civilizations to arise. And the problem with the galaxy isn't one of distance, it's only 100,000 light years across, but of time, it takes a very long time to cross 100,000 light years. But if a civilization is 10 million years old, then they could have done it pretty easily, especially if they did it robotically. This could mean that there are probes in most star systems of the galaxy from another civilization, or even multiple probes from multiple civilizations. This creates a problem. Anytime you have a more advanced alien civilization's technology close to you, you are at a significant disadvantage. It is in control, and its intentions, whether friendly or nefarious, don't matter. It simply is the civilization with superior technology, and by that virtue, it is in control. This could lead to a situation similar to how we deal with ants and mice. They have no technology at all, and they have no understanding of the technologies we can deploy against them. But we leave them alone, until they become a nuisance or we find them in the kitchen. Once that happens, we have a number of technologies available to us to get rid of them. Likewise, we could be in that boat. Number 8. The Technosignatures of War The idea of detecting a war between advanced alien civilizations is an intriguing one. 
Indeed, the discovery of gamma ray bursts was by accident by the Vela spy satellites in 1967 and kept classified until 1973. The Vela satellites were designed to detect gamma rays emitted by nuclear weapons tests, but here they detected a flash of gamma rays of unknown origin. But the flash did not have any of the hallmarks of a nuclear bomb going off, rather something else. As the Vela program continued and better instrumentation was launched, more of these bursts were detected. Today, gamma ray bursts are still mysterious, but appear to have an astrophysical origin in the form of neutron star mergers and supernovas. But on the table as well has been that some of them have an alien origin, in that it might be aliens firing up or coming out of warp with their Alcubierre warp drives. It's easy to imagine that back in 1967, one could speculate that Vela was detecting distant nuclear wars in all directions of space on a titanic scale, though no one at the time seems to have given that much credence. You'd need some really massive nukes that don't work like ours to do that. But what of the idea of detecting an alien war? Well, the reality is that while you can detect human thermonuclear wars if you're close, you probably wouldn't see the detonations very distantly. But if you did, they have very technological characteristics, such as the double flash that wouldn't be seen as natural. But there's no guarantee that advanced aliens would use nuclear weapons. They may have far more advanced weapons that we haven't even conceived of. But there are a few speculative ones that we can consider. One of these is the Alcubierre drive itself. It has been suggested that an Alcubierre drive would build up enormous amounts of radiation while it traveled at faster than light speed. This hypothetical drive is consistent with general relativity, and works by splitting off a piece of space-time itself and sending it at faster than light speeds across space. Space-time itself isn't limited by the speed of light, so if you located a spacecraft sitting stationary on a piece of isolated space-time that's moving faster than light, then there you have it, a faster than light drive. But you could also just as easily put a missile of sorts there and create a bubble of space-time traveling at superluminal speeds, collecting radiation only to somehow fall out of warp near the enemy planet and irradiate it before they ever knew it was coming at faster than light speeds. And then there are other detectable war technosignatures, such as the nickel Dyson Death Star Beam, variant of the Dyson Sphere concept, and utterly titanic detonations caused by antimatter weaponry. But the reality is we really have no idea what alien warfare would actually look like, for all we know, the direction they choose to go is to make it undetectable at a distance, and that gives them secrecy and an advantage if we ever run across them. Number 7. The Galactic Necropolis We humans spend a lot of time dealing with death. It's a fact of life, and it happens to all of us. And, as such, throughout human history and indeed hominid history, we have recognized death, and humans since the beginning have performed rituals regarding it, we still do it in the form of funerals, and burials and cremations and commemorations of the dead. This is overwhelmingly common with humans for reasons obvious to us all, but something like it is seen in the animal kingdom as well. There are many species on earth that have a death response. Elephants, for example, often fixate on the bones of their dead, often for many years after the death of the elephant who left the bones. As a technological civilization that could go extinct, if we were actually faced with imminent extinction, say an asteroid we couldn't divert, would our last act be to construct a monument to ourselves that would preserve some kind of aspect of our existence in hopes that an alien civilization someday might find it? Maybe all civilizations do this when they reach their end, whether natural or at their own hands. This leads to a somewhat disturbing solution to the Fermi Paradox. It's that many alien civilizations have existed, but they're all dead and that the great silence we see is because we're the only ones in the galaxy left alive. The galaxy is a cemetery at that point, full of the monuments of past civilizations. These could come in any number of forms. They could be as simple as a piece of concrete inscribed with the equivalent of the name of the alien civilization with the equivalent date they became a civilization to the date it ended. Or it could be much more complex and be an archive of all the data that civilization ever collected across its lifetime or it could be more like a time capsule containing relevant artifacts of that civilization. The last is most interesting because if we were under imminent extinction, would we load up the Mona Lisa on a rocket and launch it into space to preserve it? I doubt Leonardo da Vinci could have predicted something like that would happen to his painting, but something tells me he would approve. 
Number 6. The Warning Signal It must be said that the argument that there really isn't a compelling reason to contact other species in the universe has some merit. It's enormously expensive in energy, time, and effort to build enormous beacons that blast an announcement of your own existence into space. We do not do this on a realistic scale, at least right now. Rather, we just emit our electromagnetic technological emissions, and they get drowned out by the background noise of the universe pretty quickly, other than a few exceptions of very powerful radar we've produced, or very powerful signals like the Arecibo message. But to pick any of that up, the aliens would have to just happen to be looking at the right time to see it. And those signals haven't been traveling across the universe very long, so is it any wonder that we haven't gotten a response? No, it really isn't. Chances are, no one's picked up those signals. But we really haven't ever been in a situation where we'd have a compelling reason to send out such a beacon signal. But there may be situations where we might. If we found some way of causing our own extinction, it might be worth the last ditch effort to create a technological tombstone to save our otherwise unsavable civilization, other than to create a record before it's gone. That's something humans on Earth have done. Entire languages on this world have gone extinct, and would be unheard of if some historian or anthropologist hadn't made a record. So maybe civilizations going extinct blast out records of themselves. Do they warn the universe not to make the technological mistakes they did? We don't know, but hidden within this is something worse. That we live in a galaxy full of warning beacons. This too humans have done where in ancient times we might warn others with smoke signals or beacon fires, but now we do it with television and radio and the internet, where if a war breaks out, we all soon know about it. Maybe that might be a compelling reason to build a powerful beacon, to warn others that something is coming, and until that happens, nothing is heard. Number 5. Identical to Humans The science of genetics holds great promise, primitive though we are in our understanding of it. Editing genes could allow us, and really already is, to treat diseases and generally improve the human condition. But the science of genetics can go much deeper because at its very most basic, it is a complex, though entirely natural, method of long-term information storage. Some of the oldest information on Earth, billions of years old, is still preserved in the genome of this planet. But only technological advancement holds back the idea of creating entire custom genomes and creating anything we want. Call it technological life, and it offers the promise of allowing us to genetically tailor ourselves, or really variations of our species, to be better suited for environments on other planets. Indeed, it has been said that Mars may not be colonized by humans per se, rather it would be more easily colonized by genetically modified humans better suited to live there. But within these far future, or perhaps not so far future, ideas is the concept of making an entirely artificial human, pieced together Frankenstein style not from bits and pieces of flesh, bone, and brain as Mary Shelley envisioned it in her day, but rather bits and pieces of genetics, or genetic creations entirely currently alien to this earth. This is well-trodden territory in science fiction, but there remains an open question. If an alien civilization decided to visit Earth, might it not try to genetically create the most suitable organism it could to survive on Earth, but also be able to interact with us? Could a highly advanced alien civilization's 3D printer probe with a full command of genetics simply say hello and print out a human to be its alien liaison with us? To go further, what if it did that and didn't tell us? Number 4. The Enforced Great Silence We are entering a really amazing time and that we are starting to gain the ability to characterize and learn about exoplanet atmospheres. With the coming launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, we might be able to spot biosignatures in exoplanet atmospheres that confirm that at least Earth's biosphere isn't alone, and there are analogs of it commonly out there. This may simply mean microbial life and photosynthesis is common amongst the exoplanets, and may not speak much else. It gets much harder to prove complex biospheres, and perhaps even harder to detect alien civilizations if you so happen to catch one while it exists. But there's also the possibility in that this could get strange indeed over the next few centuries, where we might see biosphere after biosphere, but not a single indication of a civilization, to the point that it almost seems unlikely that after all of these biosphere detections, we saw not a single technosignature. 
This could lead to all sorts of science fiction scenarios of civilizations that either never achieve technology or choose not to, or something in our history that allowed us to get lucky, and most planets with complex life never need to go quite so far as intelligence evolutionarily speaking. And then there is another option. The last possibility is that one dominant civilization in the Milky Way, older than all the others, that sees its role to be a reset button. Perhaps it realizes that high technology isn't all it's cracked up to be, so periodically goes around and resets civilizations to the maximum level of biological happiness that it sees as ideal. Or perhaps it wants to prevent advanced science from affecting the galaxy, and that the whole thing is better off as a managed nature preserve. In which case it's not quite the zoo hypothesis, but rather the enforcement of a no littering sign in a galactic national park. You may not be in a zoo, but your civilization may be a majestic elk grazing in a field. Just don't try to leave that field please, or you might get culled. Number 3. They work like ants. An often repeated statement in astrobiology discussions is that we would be like ants to an alien civilization and thus they wouldn't care about us. We're too primitive to worry about. But flip that question around. What if the aliens were like ants? This would be bad news. Life on Earth is beyond diverse with all manner of behavior and forms, and we don't even know about some of them, especially the oceanic life. And sometimes within life on Earth, we find some absolutely appalling behavior. The ants are no stranger to this. Take the species Colobopsis sondersi, otherwise known as the exploding ant. This ant has reservoirs of toxins running the length of its body that it can use during combat using its oversized mandibles, but if it looks like it's going to lose the battle, it can, in a last ditch effort, contract certain muscles and cause those reservoirs to explode in an act known as suicidal altruism. The ant then literally explodes and coats nearby combatants with toxic and sticky material, thereby immobilizing them in a last service to the ant's colony. If you ever met an alien like this, first contact could become quite unpleasant indeed if you challenge it to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. And then there is how ants communicate. If alien communication works like this, it's unlikely we'd ever figure this one out, especially if it sent some radio signal representation of it. Ants communicate through a mix of pheromones, body language, touch, sometimes sound, and even sharing food mouth to mouth. Saying hello to an alien like this would involve it smelling you, and perhaps emitting a smell of its own, wildly gesticulating at you and touching you with whatever appendages it has, making noises that could mean anything, before finally approaching you with a chunk of its extremely alien food in its quote unquote mouth, expecting you to take a bite which you better do exactly right. And then there are more smells. If you refuse and it interprets it as an act of aggression, it then explodes and covers you with sticky corrosive goo. Human historians would see it as not our best first contact. Number two, the universe was created by aliens. There are many ways to ponder the nature of the universe and its beginning. On the one hand, the very question could be said to be meaningless, after all the universe is all that is, was, or will ever be by definition. But it's an unsatisfying definition in that it leaves many questions open, such as is this the first universe, or is it another iteration of a cycle? Or in the many worlds interpretation, is it just one reality of a nearly infinite amount of realities all following slightly different timelines? We may never know the answer to these questions, but the greatest question is who, if anyone, created it all. There are many potential answers to this question, but one in particular has been a subject of some interest for many years now, because there may actually be a way to devise an experiment to prove or disprove it. It's simulation theory, the idea that we live in a matrix of sorts and that all reality is being created to simulate a universe for some reason. One idea here is Nick Bostrom's take where this could be an ancestor simulation in that far future humans are simulating the universe as it once was, and presumably taking a look at their own beginnings. But this idea of a simulated universe can take a somewhat spooky turn in that it might also be possible that we are a mere byproduct of such a simulation. Think aliens simulating their own history inadvertently simulating us just because we happen to be there. 
In this take on a simulation universe, the simulators might not know we were here, or if they did, they might not care, or may even use such simulations as an easier way to do SETI searches by simulating the beginnings of civilizations popping up in their simulations and then going out to find the end result in their real universe, assuming that it too is not a simulation. Number 1. Berserker Machine Intelligence On this channel, I've covered most of the variants of the idea of self-replicating probes that could colonize the galaxy in geologically relatively short periods of time, if they don't care about the passage of time or the distances involved as a biological being might. At sublight speeds, such an undertaking might not be that big of a deal, a process of a few million years in a universe well old enough for that to have happened many times over possibly even extragalactically to some extent. Crossing space-time is hard for biology, but not so much for advanced technology. But as with anything technological, there is always the chance that something might go wrong, and some probe intended for the peaceful colonization and terraforming of worlds might run up against an already inhabited planet and basically erase the whole thing and start over, tilling under the remains of another civilization. This could be intentionally done by some sociopathic alien or machine civilization, or could just be the result of a programming error or errant cosmic ray hitting the machinery wrong. But this idea can be taken to far spookier sci-fi territory. If von Neumann probes weren't enough, there is the concept of a von Neumann hive mind. Fred Saberhagen in his Berserker series details how we might go to war with such a thing, pointing out that while his berserkers aren't von Neumann machines in and of themselves, their civilization is. In a biological way, so are we. We self-replicate and we build machines that are beginning to be able to self-replicate themselves. As we build the mountain of data that our civilization is becoming, this data is accessible to both computer and human. As a result, a kind of merging is occurring between humans and machines as far as data goes and this is likely to only get worse. As such, it can be envisioned where a biological civilization can create a civilization of interconnected self-replicating machines that have such things as machine learning, self-improvement, and artificial intelligence. This could lead to an entire hybrid integrated biological machine hive mind civilization, much like the Borg, but perhaps worse, bearing attributes of both biological and technological systems. What comes of that is an open question, but I suspect here science fiction has generally been spot on when it's touched on this. This is not really something you want to run across in the dark corners of the Milky Way galaxy. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about faster than light projectiles. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So imagine, if you will, a far future human starship ejecting a pineapple past its expiration date out the airlock at FTL speeds. This would create a highly dangerous and energetic object traveling across the universe that may well hit someone or something. Add another to the list of weird things that have popped out of my noggin over the years. Schrodinger's possum, the antimatter donut, the angry Wermigrib von Neumann probe, and now the faster than light pineapple. I may have too much time on my hands, which is why I'm making so many videos lately. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.